MKBHD here, and this is the new M1 iPad Pro. It looks almost exactly the same as the last one. That's because if the screen's not on, it almost is the same as the last one. But there are a couple things that are new about this that make it even more of the ultimate iPad, which again, naturally raises the question of like, well, what is an iPad anyway? And what is a computer? Uh, I'll get to that later. So the last iPad Pro wasn't that long ago. You can watch the review from last year, but in short, it had an A12Z chip and that was a spec bump from the previous iPad Pro, which had an A12X. Now, of course, there were other small bits and things that made last year's iPad new, but now again, in 2021, we have an even more powerful chip. So this iPad Pro has Apple's M1 inside. Now, the A12X and the A12Z were already Apple-designed silicon for the iPad. So while we know M1 is a different breed, since it's also Apple-designed silicon, it would be tempting to think maybe that's not that big of a jump, like those chips were made for the iPad. How good could M1 be? Uh, that would be wrong. This is a massive performance leap forward. M1 in this new iPad Pro means that now, internally, this tablet is basically the same as the M1 MacBook Air, a full-blown computer. That means an eight-core CPU, eight-core GPU, 16-core neural engine, and for the first time, Apple is just openly telling us how much RAM is in the iPad. So that's eight gigs in the lower storage versions and 16 gigs of RAM in the one terabyte or the new two terabyte iPad configurations. 16 gigs of RAM in an iPad. So it turns out, yeah, this thing flies again through iPad OS. I'm sure it's shocking to you that an even more powerful, even faster chip continues to crush iPad OS in its latest version. But there's a couple other like specific unique ways I've noticed this. First of all, even the heaviest, most graphically demanding apps that I use are snappy and blazing fast. That's probably also as you'd expect. But also with all this RAM, and this is a one terabyte iPad, so it has 16 gigs of RAM, it really seems like nothing ever needs to drop from memory. It's kind of wild. Like we're already used to a bunch of the most recent apps staying in RAM on the iPad, and that's great. But here, even the oldest, heaviest apps in my multitasking tray just pick right up where they left off. Like Lightroom from hours ago, games, streaming apps. <laughs> it really feels like this iPad's superpower here. Stuff just happily sits in RAM all day and is always ready to go. But even that doesn't really fully explain the speed. So let me just, so, so numbers people, we like benchmarks, right? They're the easy way to contextualize the differences in performance. So remember when the A12Z iPad Pro last year was already pretty far ahead of most other tablets? On Geekbench, for example, that was hitting somewhere around 4,500 to 4,700 on multi-core, and so was the A12X. This M1 iPad hit 6,900 points, sometimes breaking 7,000. That's just in a completely new stratosphere. <laughs> That's actually higher than the 16-inch MacBook Pro. On the longer, more detailed and 2 benchmark, the A12Z was a small bump up over the A12X, so it went from 717,000 to 723,000. Then M1 iPad Pro just casually drops a score of 1,084,000 points. So it's literally 30 to 45% faster than the last iPad Pro, which was already faster than pretty much every other tablet. It's like, you just don't see these types of performance increases year to year that often. Uh, so we knew Apple Silicon was special, but I mean, it's just it's kind of ridiculous. It's actually kind of a struggle to find the places where a regular user might find this extra performance here. Like, I guess that's the point. A regular user is never going to use all of this performance. They'll get an iPad Air. But hey, this is called the iPad Pro for a reason. And so there are actually a few pro workflows that might be taxing the current iPads or might benefit from the extra headroom in the new one. Uh, I did a one hour iMovie export test. The last iPad Pro crushed it in 17 minutes. The M1 iPad did it in 12 minutes flat. So there's another 30% improvement for you. Uh, if you're doing a bunch of batch Lightroom imports and exports, for example, or just a bunch of heavier things like that in succession, then of course, this new iPad is going to be great. And then all that RAM makes the heavier edits in LumaFusion or bigger projects with a lot more layers in Photoshop, that type of stuff 
more snappy. That's that's the real high-end benefit here. But there are a few other new things with this iPad Pro 2, aside from just performance. Uh, it is a little bit thicker and heavier, actually. It's it's very it's barely, you might not even notice, but it's uh, we're talking half a millimeter thicker and 50 grams. But it was enough for me to notice, so I'm mentioning it to you. Uh, and it's actually to accommodate the new M1 stuff, the new display, which I'll get to, but also uh, a little bit of a bigger battery, physically speaking, in this bigger one. So. Would you look at that? Apple making a product slightly thicker for a slightly bigger battery. Nice. The cellular option, which I'm holding, is also now 5G, which is pretty sweet. So now, in addition to the antenna bands, the cellular iPad now has this little plastic cutout at the bottom next to the speakers, just like the 5G iPhones have on the sides. And that USB-C port at the bottom, now that there's an M1 chip inside, is now a Thunderbolt port with USB 4 speeds up to 40 gigabits per second throughput, which is massive so if you want to plug in an ethernet dongle here you can get 10 gigabit ethernet which hey if your setup involves plugging your ipad into ethernet more power to you but also that's a huge win for faster file transfers again if you're importing like a ton of photos straight from the camera through a cable or even videos it's enough bandwidth to now really make a difference you can also plug straight into the pro display xdr and drive it at full resolution 6k again not sure whose setup that is, but more power to you. But maybe the most interesting unexpected change to this new iPad is now actually the front-facing camera. So no, they didn't move it to the middle at the top where it should be, but they did add an ultra-wide camera. Now listen, I'm never gonna advocate for taking photos on the iPad. It's just, it's just not gonna happen. But something I do on the iPad pretty often is video calls, video chats. FaceTimes, and this new camera setup with a 122 degree field of view is great for that. So basically when you open the camera app for a selfie, you'll see the normal view, but when you zoom out, you'll see a whole lot more of the scene with that ultra wide. Now it's heavily distorted near the edges, even with distortion correction turned on in settings. Not sure that is actually correcting anything, but hey, an ultra wide camera is really useful despite not solving the problem of being in the wrong place. Now, when you're in a supported app, there's a new feature called Center Stage that kicks in and does a pretty good job of basically following a face around that ultra-wide frame. So it zooms in a bit and focuses on the face and keeps it kind of near the middle. And if more than one face gets into the frame, it also tries to stay wide enough to keep them both and follow both of them. Overall, it's pretty simple, just a sort of a neat touch, but it works pretty smoothly most of the time, and I found it a nice addition that just makes a lot of sense on the iPad. Also, if you ever wanna turn this off, you can jump into the settings app, pick the app that you wanna turn it off in, and then within the settings, you'll see a center stage checkbox. So there's no other settings or adjusting it. You can just turn it on or off. So if you wanna keep it on in FaceTime, but turn it off in Zoom, then you can make that happen. If you were thinking this might also finally let Face ID work for more angles, it doesn't, it's, it's literally just the camera. So the dot projector and infrared stuff is all working the same way it normally does, just the camera's wider. Okay, there's one last feature that is new on this iPad Pro and really does make a pretty big difference, and that is this screen, this new screen here. So on the bigger one, just the bigger one, the bigger 12.9 inch iPad Pro, you've got a new liquid Retina XDR display. It's pretty sweet, but the smaller 11 inch iPad Pro basically has the same screen as last year. But this new screen is awesome. Mainly, it just it gets way brighter, which is immediately noticeable, way more visible if you're near a window or in bright environment. And it's a mini LED display with 2,500 local dimming zones made up of 10,000 mini LEDs. All to say, you're gonna get a couple things. Brighter highlights, up to 1,600 nits for peak brightness, full HDR support, and better contrast. So you're at a million to one contrast ratio now. To me, honestly, it looks just about as good as OLED. I mean, the thing about so much of the content you watch on the iPad is you almost always have those black bars because of the aspect ratio, and those look way closer to black now with the black bezels. Plus, there's all this local contrast and specular highlights just look awesome. So now any shows or videos you wanna watch in HDR look that much more impressive, and a full HDR creation workflow 
is sort of unlocked now from beginning to end. So if you wanna shoot and edit and export and upload HDR videos or photos, you can do all of that from this iPad. So now remember when I was saying the, you know, the iPhone 12 started shooting Dolby Vision HDR video, but it turns out there wasn't that many places to actually view it. Well, here's one more great place to view it on the larger new M1 iPad Pro. Now the question that I'm sure is on plenty of minds like it was on mine when I saw the announcement, why no mini LED on the smaller M1 iPad Pro? And I'm, I'm thinking it's a cost thing. This is just me speculating. You know, it's, it is more expensive. OLED is also more expensive, but not quite as bright. So this is a great tech to see in the iPad, but it's kind of a shame because I really like the smaller iPad Pro. That's the one I personally use from back in 2018 actually. So because this new one doesn't have this mini LED display, it's yet another performance bump that I don't need. So I feel like I'm not gonna upgrade. I'm gonna keep using my two generation old 11 inch iPad Pro. But yeah, this one is nice. Everything else though about this M1 iPad Pro is pretty much exactly the same as last year's, which is to say really, really, really good. So the quad speakers are still super loud and sound great. The microphones are still awesome. The body is still all metal, same design. And the dual cameras plus LiDAR are still here on the back and still great for a tablet. Plus actually the M1 chip now allows for Smart HDR3 from the rear cameras for all you iPad photographers out there. Please don't. Uh, but then again, iPad OS is still iPad OS, which to me, really gets me thinking that the iPadOS 15 update that's coming up has gotta be a pretty significant change to what we have now in iPadOS 14.5. Like it's gotta be, right? Like there's been some rumors floating around now about some pretty big home screen changes, widgets being able to drop anywhere on any home screen, and maybe some more significant multitasking improvements on the iPad. I might keep my eye out at WWDC for something like that. But yeah, I mean, other than that, it's again, it's it's another iPad Pro doing the same stuff even faster. So if you had some, some bottleneck issues, if you had those heavy Pro workflows, then you'll really notice the difference between M1 iPad Pro and the already fast A12Z iPad Pro. But yeah, and it's getting kind of ridiculous at this point. All right, a couple other miscellaneous things that didn't quite fit into the full review. There is a new Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro people were wondering about. Slightly different, uh, but it's functionally exactly the same. Really, it's just adjusted slightly for the half a millimeter of extra thickness for the iPad. So you can still totally use the old Magic Keyboard. I tried, works perfect. It just might feel a little bit snug when it's closed, that's all, no biggie. And the battery life, even though a bunch of variables have changed, still feels about the same, maybe a little bit worse if anything, because you gotta factor in, so now if your battery life is here, you add a more powerful M1 chip, you add 16 gigs of RAM that tons of apps are staying in, you add a mini LED display that's much brighter, but also a larger battery capacity. So we've ended up about the same rating. So at the end of the day, it's rated for the same 10 hours as the last one. I feel like the magic of the M1 is really giving me great standby time, but I was able to run through the battery a little faster at full brightness with high intensity stuff going on, especially when connected to the Magic Keyboard. Not a huge surprise. This M1 iPad Pro is the ultimate spec bump. Because again, fundamentally, it's just crushing the same things that any previous iPad Pro could do just even faster with a better screen. And that's gonna be great for a lot of people. But I'm just, I feel like I'm just impatient for like a better use of all this power, if that makes sense. Like it feels like I'm like like upgrading to a Ferrari but sitting in city traffic all day, you know what I mean? Or like strapping rockets to your car when what you really wanted was a pickup truck. I don't know if I'm making any sense right now. My point is if it's a computer you're after, uh, the M1 MacBook Air is the same computer, but uh, it's cheaper, it's thinner, it's lighter, it's, it's better balanced overall as a computer with the keyboard and the screen. It's, and it's not an iPad, you know, it's not a touch screen, it doesn't have 5G, no center stage. But if it's a tablet you're after with the touch screen, with 5G, with all the apps, with the Apple Pencil, with the XDR display, all this stuff, this, this is the GOAT. This is the GOAT of tablets, I'm saying it. Uh, it can also sort of convert partially into a computer if you want it to. 
But as I explored in this video right up here, it, it isn't really ready to be like a full-time computer for a lot of people just quite yet. But as a tablet, it's the GOAT. Matter of fact, here's a theory to think about. Is this new iPad too good? Meaning like, it feels like the only thing holding this iPad back is Apple protecting the Macs a little bit. Because honestly, think about it. If, if this iPad got the iOS 15 makeover that I want, if it got Final Cut and it got like a serious keyboard dock that you just plug into and it's weighted properly and it doesn't suck on your lap, I wouldn't have a MacBook, honestly. I would just use this. Like, would anyone need a laptop if the software really made the difference? Something to think about. I'll uh, entertain that in the comment section below. Anyway, that's basically it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. What are you waiting for? Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.